So as Linda said, my name is Ben Bevins. I'm the global team uh, manager, leader. Uh, it's been about a year since I've been in this role. Uh, I remember sitting uh, with Dave and chatting about whether or not to take up this role and, uh, and accepting and then sitting down with the team and kind of deciding what are, the, what are the top three things that we want to exist for here at the Journey Church and what we want to achieve. And I would say definitely top three, probably top one, is uh, the communication and the support of the Susies. Um, that, that's been huge in this church, especially being the sending church uh, for the Susies. So I guess uh, with that being said, it is with great honor and pleasure that this morning I get to introduce to you Bruno and Kathleen Susi. Come on up, guys. Well, thanks so much for, for the welcome. Um, we've been away for eight years, so a lot of you, you only know us by by pictures and reputation, but we, this is still our home church, um, and we're really pleased with that. Thanks, Ben, for, we know there's a lot of work, and sometimes we're not very cooperative, but um, <laughs> I said that that quarterly newsletter goes out at least twice a year, and uh, so we <laughs> try to do that a little better. Um, we're just, um, as I was uh, going through the worship this morning, I was thinking like, if we could just meditate on those, those two songs that, that you guys selected for the worship time. Um, if we just meditate on that, frankly, I'd, I don't have a lot to add to, to, uh, to what those songs uh, were telling us. Um, just wanna, we, we believe, of course, we, we are missionaries in some parts of the world that actually were called global field staff because sometimes missionary has negative connotations outside the, the, the church world. And, uh, but that's what, that's what we are. We're, we're trying to facilitate missions. And, and um, really, when, I, when we talk about missions, we're really saying activities that bear witness to the gospel of God's kingdom in word and deed and to the people outside the congregation. Um, and, and I think you guys, all of us are working through that. And, you, and I think you're doing a, a relatively effective job at, at touching people outside of your own family. Uh, Emil Bruner said, the church exists by mission as fire exists by burning. So the church without mission isn't really church. Um, a church without a strong sense of mission has lost its purpose. Uh, followers of Jesus are at the forefront of mov movements to share their faith, to feed the hungry, to treat the wounds of war, to combat racism, and uh, to protect children and restore the environment. And that we're just so pleased to be with you in that mission. So what we thought we would do today is just share a little bit for the, for our own, it was such an encouragement, you know, to come here. When we came home this time, uh, we said to CBM, you know, gee, I don't have a hip to be replaced, a knee to be replaced. I have no, you know, really, I'm, well, how can we not come home to Canada? And um, so we decided that we needed to make this trip for ourselves so that we could be with you here. Um, we went to Oasis, but other than that, um, our focus was to be with our family and to spend time with you here at the Journey Church. And um, eight years is a long time. And for us, a lot of things have, have evolved in that period of time. Um, amazing things that we have seen um, God do in our lives, in the lives of people around us, and uh, just, uh, really changing us. And so the church, this church, as our sending church, and as we have gone through this journey together, for, those of, for the benefit of those who haven't been here that long, um, we just thought it would be really good to just kind of recap a little bit of that history that we've had together. Because back in 2004, 2005, when we started on this road, as a church, I remember Bruno was on the missions committee back then, and you know, we really weren't doing a lot of things in a global sense. You know, we were reaching out locally, yes, but we really hadn't done that. And, and, and as the church was kind of working through this, as a couple, um, actually as a family, because we did have a 12-year-old son at the time, who we still do have. Um, <laughs> um, and actually, I gotta keep to the script because we'll never 
do the time thing here, but um, for a young boy that was going to Rwanda because, well, I guess if you and dad have been called, I've been called too, but he really wanted to stay home with his sisters. Um, and now as a 20 year old um, finishing off his university degree, his goal is to go back to Rwanda. So that's really a God thing. Um, but going into this history of our journey together in this, um, we were, as a couple, uh, looking at what opportunities there were to serve the poor in other parts of the world, to use our gifts and talents that way. And this brought us, as a church, but also as a couple, to look at the mission arm of the Baptist churches in Canada, which is Canadian Baptist Ministries. And so what that's meant for Bruno and I is that over the past seven years, we've served in Rwanda in a capacity of supporting lo through local churches in Rwanda, their development um, projects uh, and also their theological development of their pastors. And we've continued through this together. This past few months, we've been living in Costa Rica, unless you think that was a really uh, awesome, I mean, you hear of Costa Rica, you know, people go there and have these wonderful experiences. Well, uh, we'll talk more about this later, but um, it was a real challenge. <laughs> and uh, estamos estudiando español, uh, but uh, that is gonna go on for a long time. Um, and of course, we're preparing to go to uh, Latin America to be team leaders there. So this is a bit of our history. And when we reflected back on the numerous Christmas offerings, the step partnership that we've been involved in here at the Journey Church, these things have all supported um, certainly our um, living and working with CBM, but also the critical needs of the church and more importantly, long-term ones. So you've probably heard these things, but I've got to repeat them. The storm uh, that damaged a school roof overnight in uh, Rwanda that really was going to uh, remain mean that five, six, seven hundred students were not going to be going to school the next day. Um, we, this, the church stepped in and replaced that roof. That was an instant thing that our church in Rwanda could never have been able to do for, uh, in that short of a period, if ever. We went on with the church to fund HIV AIDS programming, which was really neat because that was a Christmas offering, but that whole offering supported the whole year of all the volunteers that go into these communities to be with people who are palliative. So at the end of life and dealing with all those issues with simple things that would just make their life easier and also to bring them spiritual comfort, um, that was pretty cool. The integral mission training for pastors has all been also been supported by the church. And the, for us, this was really key because so many of our friends in Rwanda, um, the whole kingdom view was when I die, and I know we've said this before, but our life begins after death. And really life begins before we die. And the idea that God is building his kingdom on earth today is, is a foreign concept for many of our friends who, who live day by day in difficult situations. So that was a huge shift that we were able to support. And then what's near and dear to my heart um, has been the support that we did as a church towards literacy for women in Rwanda. And you know, for us, <laughs> Uh, that was such a powerful thing. It started out as a very small um, work with uh, um, a group, uh, several groups, several churches there. But today, we've been gone from Rwanda since September of last year. And in, that, in our absence now, our um, Rwandan colleagues have had developed a partnership with the new National Library in Rwanda, and they're doing family literacy. So that's come out of the fact that they've seen this local church doing literacy program for the past five, six years that has been really effective. And in fact, I'm thinking there's 93% of the people that go through that six-month program of literacy, and they're reading the Bible. They're able to um, be more active active in every aspect of life and I'm thinking like could you do it in Spanish please but that hasn't happened yet um, so I'm so excited about, about being able to tell you some of those things. The other uh, piece, of course, that we've been really involved in has been uh, pastoral training, women's leadership, and food security. And the church has been, our church here, the Journey Church, has been together with this work with the local churches in Rwanda. And that's not just through financial giving, but through your presence. We've had two teams over a four-year period. Um, and that's been a help to our Rwandan partners. 
for them as well as for our Canadian churches to live out what it means to be a Christ follower. So those are just some of the things that I wanted to share about. With well, the one picture that you won't see up there, Bruno said, Kathleen, you cannot put that up there. But Carolyn did experience a new fruit, uh, fruit um, sensation and the look on her face is priceless. So if you wish to see that, I will show you that in private after. <laughs> so I think, Ben, this is our shift where you're gonna ask us a couple of questions. I think uh, I'm just gonna take a just a few moments and just ask really one question. Um, a lot of people have, have known about the, the role that you've played in Rwanda over the past number of years, and uh, I don't think they really know a lot about the, the infrastructure that you have put in place since you first stepped foot in Rwanda. Uh, so can, maybe you can just explain to some people here, now that you are not present in Rwanda, what does it look like today? I mean, did things just fall off the train and it's, you know, reversed, or are things just, you know, you've set the, root, the roots, you've planted the seeds, and things are still going forward? As we think about um, what do you leave um, when, you, when you leave something, what, what's going to stay, what's going to remain? And probably one of the greatest joys I have is the team of Rwandans that we worked with. When we started, there was one person doing some secretarial work and, and trying to manage a few little things. We have seven people that we helped to hire, we helped to grow their capacity to, to manage things and to do good works and be good stewards. And those guys are still there. So without us, uh, the work continues. I, I think we can still, having Canadian presence for the way we work is, is always a beneficial thing, but it's, it's not, nothing fell flat because Kathleen and I left. Um, and we're also pleased that uh, there's two new couples in the works. One arrived a couple weeks ago um, and another couple is coming in a few months when they get through with their fundraising. So that, that accompaniment piece is hugely important to doing good work and also to being able to translate the learning that we can get from our partner back to assist because we have a mandate towards our Canadian churches as well uh, to, to help you grow in your understanding and in your effectiveness in touching your community. So that's, that's real really good. And for, for people who still have um, a desire to follow what's happening in Rwanda or to continue fostering relationships with people they may have met along the way who may be in Rwanda, what's the best way for people here to, to continue to find out what's going on there? Well, I think um, for sure you can, you can touch us because, um, you know, we will never be, le we will never have left Rwanda. Our bodies have, but um, that we're very connected there. But um, through our CBM website, there people are blogging all the time. They are so far beyond us in all that category. So there's ways to keep in touch. So you have um, some contact information over there and I think it'd be great, especially the two new couples that are gonna be there. We're really excited about them and the strengths that they're gonna bring to help our partners there. Well, it was an amazing chapter. Uh, we're, we're glad we get to experience it with you. Um, let's flip the page and Let's hear about the next one. Okay, thank you. We've talked a little bit about the past and just talk about going forward because uh, the past was good and we hope the going forward will be just as exciting. We're, um, we've taken on new roles with CBM as uh, Latin America team leaders and uh, that means that we'll, we'll continue this, the, uh, the approach of, of CBM um, methodology and how we work with local churches and always by invitation. Um, and many of you know that working through local churches is messy and complicated <laughs> um, because it's full of messy, complicated people. And, um, and, and that's, there, there are times, frankly, when, I, when I've thought, you know what, if it was about accomplishing the work, whatever that is, it would probably be easier to do that outside the church. But we really believe that that's God's plan is that the local church is his face and his hand into communities. And so that's, that's how we're choosing to work in spite of the, the, uh, the messiness of that. Um, our commitment is long-term and requires accompaniment. Uh, we've seen that partnerships that do well typically have Canadians on the ground helping both the Canadians who come to visit and also the national people to navigate the challenges and the privileges that we have because we are working together as partners in mission. Um, we, um, 
the work that we'll do will we'll, uh, support the CBM efforts um, between partner churches in Canada and in Latin America. Um, we, we will support work that's already underway, um, as well as look for additional opportunities um, to benefit both the Latin churches and the Canadian constituency. Uh, initially, we'll live in Bolivia. Our, our role is Latin America, which is more than Bolivia, but that's where uh, CBM's investment has been for more than 100 years we've been in Bolivia, and then, so there's a huge history there. And that history can be uh, a, a real positive thing, and it also uh, can be a challenge as we try to affect change. Um, <clears throat> the, right in a few months, there'll only be one remaining CBM couple in, in Bolivia. And uh, some of you may know the history there. At one time, there were over 25 Canadian missionaries in Bolivia at the same time. So there's hundreds of missionary families I've been through through Bolivia. Uh, from that location in Bolivia for the first few years, we'll also support um, work that's happening in Cuba. It has a solid church and a, a church leadership base, um, and we think has tremendous potential to grow the Cuban church and also to, to affect Canadian churches that will partner with them over the next few years as we expect Cuba will open up its economy and its, and its uh, society to, to the outside. We worked in Haiti. And we have a heart for Haiti. I, a lot of the, the Francophone churches in Canada are actually, um, many, many of the members are, are uh, originally from the Haitian community. And so there's tremendous potential to help them develop in their mission-mindedness <coughs> and their understanding of, of uh, sustainable development. Um, El Salvador has a long history, and, um, and right now it's suffering a bit, but we have a heart. It was an important piece, of Kathleen and my, uh, our trip, our our trip to El Salvador was really the, I say, the tipping point for me to say, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. <clears throat> um, we'll also be looking at new opportunities. Um, I think because of proximity and, and uh, often many of the connections that we already have as Canadians um, north-south, we think there's huge opportunities for us to engage Canadian churches with, with partnerships in Latin America. So as we get control of, of the business we're already <laughs> involved with to try to grow our activities and, and, I, and I think there's good potential there. So as we kind of gather our breath and um, after this period of language learning and um, going into this new, these new roles, you know, it was really worth our while to sit down and think about, well, what are some of the strengths? What are some of the things that we're gonna bring to this? Because, you know, we needed, God to build us up through that, <laughs> um, especially after the challenges of um, not becoming really fluent in Spanish in a sh the short time that we thought we would. So after the seven years in Rwanda, you know, we've learned a few things and the biggest thing is that we have been absolutely humbled by what we've learned from living and working with people who have so little and do so much with it. And you saw one of the pictures in the Rwanda slide of this church family, the, the church um, in the, this um, half-built church. And it's bursting at the seams with people. Like n the fact that we don't have a building or that we're a few bricks, many bricks short of the roof, uh, we're gonna meet anyway. And so that was a, a huge learning for us and uh, very humbling and you need to stay humble because it's so easy as the Western person with the education and especially the resources that an organization like CBM, as small as we are, have, um, it can overwhelm our partners. So the other uh, learning that we had as well was through the development of this team that we were privileged to work with. And really, we um, really felt we were part of being able to demonstrate the power of collaboration. And we know that in any context, but especially I think in um, what we've understood from the, our short time in East Africa is that it, that's risky for a lot of people. We don't want to share what we have. Um, we don't want to trust you that you care more about me and my ability to use my God-given talents effectively. I'm just going to be careful. And so what we saw after a long period of time was the lid blown off of that and the creativeness and um, to see people empowered and uh, really using all of their, all of their gifts. That was exciting. Um, the other thing was, and this I think is really 
uh, kicks in with, with our church here and our experience. You know, we had this intimate experience with our own church, with the visits, the, the people that came. But we also had many, many other churches in Canada that we were privileged to work with. And that was a huge thing because that whole understanding of short-term missions, what it means, how, how does that, tra how do you do the whole circle? You come for two weeks, but guess what? Your SDM experience is a whole year before that. Mind you, some churches spend a couple of weeks preparing. But um, our hope is, you know, when you see that happening, and then what happens after? And there's so much that we need to learn as people working and serving God through CBM from, from our experiences together and how to do that that is going to be um, effective and really bear witness to the gospel, um, both here and where we're working. So we had to look at some of the challenges as well. So uh, going forward, and one is the, certainly the history of Bolivia. Bruno mentioned this a little bit, but what really, the, there's a legacy in Bolivia of old style missions. Now there's some people here that have been to Bolivia, I'm sure. And the Baptist Church over 100 years ago, the ba there was the Baptist Church of Canada went to Bolivia and began the Baptist Church, the United Baptist Church of Bolivia. And it was Canadians. And then over time, there were many, many Baptist churches in Bolivia, but guess what? They were all Canadian pastors. So it took time for there to be a shift. You know, somebody thought, you know, that's probably not healthy. So then um, what happened was we, we uh, withdrew those Canadian pastors and built into uh, nurturing Bolivian pastors. So now all the churches are led by Bolivian pastors, which is great, but guess what? Canada was still funding their salaries. So it took a number of years again to shift that responsibility that this was the, the Bolivian church. And um, so today we still see um, vestiges, is that the right word? I'm really having trouble with all my words, but anyway, of the um, continuation of this, especially in our role as we support development because that somehow has gotten over here and the church is over here. So the challenge, we, one of the challenges that we see is that um, we, to help support the church to bring those things together and get away from this idea that the Canadians are going to support everything that's happening there. Integral mission, that's another challenge. You know, how do we encourage our partner to engage in um, church community-based activities? You know, this is a challenge for our Canadian churches. Um, you know, how many of our Canadian churches are actually practicing integral mission? How do we even understand what that looks like? And then to expect that of the folks that we're working with in uh, these other countries. So we're, we're all in this process together. Another challenge, and it's a big one, is language. You know, I don't think Bruno and I ever realized what we were getting into. In fact, I said, Bruno, we actually asked to do this. And, um, <laughs> And, and what happens if we fail? Because, you know, no lingo, no go, because you have to, there's no English. We had English and French in Rwanda. By the end of our time, every, the whole country's English. So they all want to speak English. So it was great. We thought, we'll help you with that. Um, but in um, all of these Latin countries, uh, Spanish is a little bit different in each one of the countries, number one. The culture is a relationship-based one. So if all you can talk about, I am a woman, I am, X years old, because I know how to say that, um, you know, you really aren't going to get very far. So all those types of things, we realize this is going to be a bit of a process. So um, we actually do understand most Spanish now, um, and we, we have a ton of grammar knowledge, but we don't have the fluency. So that's going to be a huge challenge going forward for us. Um, travel. Uh, how do we live in a place like Bolivia where the needs are so great and obviously we're going to want to be good advocates for the work there and see that come, become healthier. Uh, however, we need to also, we have a broader mandate. So how do we do that and not take up all of um, our time on the challenges um, just in Bolivia? So we're asking you to pray for us around the language issue. Um, uh, also, when we leave September 17th to go to Bolivia, people said, so you have a house or apartment or how are you living? We go, mm, we don't know. <laughs> and uh, that's kind of how we went to Rwanda. So our goal was to go with two suitcases each. So we'll see if we can manage that. <laughs> um, 
So that's, a, that's something there, that we'd be in a safe area and that we could be able to do it fairly quickly. Um, also, prayer for new Canadian staff to come to Bolivia. You, you heard one, one staff family is there doing theological training. We are so excited. It's taken a year, but we are so excited to see uh, dynamic individuals coming to Rwanda. And so we're really praying for that for in Bolivia. We also uh, would like prayer for good cultural guides for us. That was a huge issue for us in Rwanda and really enabled us so well to get connected. And so we really do need to have that so we can develop healthy relationships in the foreign language and especially a culture that's very different again. And prayer for all of our Latin American partners, you know, it's not easy to have these partnerships. Um, uh, it's, it's a challenge for everybody and we want to honor God through all of that. And, and that slide is appropriate because we're going into water that we're not sure how deep it is. <clears throat> But they made it through. I was filming, but I Kathleen didn't went. want to go in. There. I did not. <laughs> so, in summary, we, we've been together for for eight years on this journey. Um, you as a sending church, we as your representatives, um, doing that work in the local communities where we've been. Um, what does it mean to practice an integral mission? And that's that's a question that we need to keep asking. What we did as mission eight years ago is different today, and I sure hope two years from now will be different again. And, and, and as we deepen our understanding, we need to do that. It's not simply sending money or, or even in your own community uh, doing good works, but rather building the kingdom um, into a community uh, here in Moncton and wherever you have influence. Um, I just want to end with a, with a verse that uh, I think sums it up. Um, and it's basically remembering that mission in the world has been entrusted to women and men who fear and who have doubts and who have it limitations, but God's ability is what helps us to transform the world. Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of you were powerful. Not many of you of noble birth, but God chose what is foolish. God chose what is weak. God chose what is low. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption in order that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Well, thank you so much for sharing uh, some about the, the new journey in Latin America. Um, just like to ask maybe a couple questions. First of all, the next 12 months, can you just kind of give us an idea of what the next 12 months looks like for you guys. I know we're, you're going to Bolivia um, without a home, uh, but just what is the actual practical uh, application, what you guys are going to be doing the next 12 months? Um, the, some of the physical things are, are uh, I mean, t somewhat intimidating, but not really a big burden, I don't think. Like getting a house, getting a car, getting all those things that need, need to be done. Um, continuing with language. we. Um, it, will be, it won't be a five day a week thing, but we still need to continue because we know that um, we need to deepen our, our level there. And then the other part is really um, um, figuring out what's going on and who the players are and how we can influence change. Bolivia has been a difficult place on our staff. There's many, many of our staff over the last few years that, that have said, you know what, I, I can't do this. Um, and we know, I, I mentioned the messiness of local church and uh, it's, it's led by people who are people and uh, sinners like the rest of us. So we need to understand how things work and how we can influence and at what pace we can influence because again, coming in, um, I think some of you knew I, I worked for, for a man just down the road here before I started this work and we'd have a meeting at 11 o'clock in the morning and make decisions and at 12 you better be doing it or there'd be trouble. You know? And so that just doesn't work like that when you're trying to affect change with people in, in that culture. And uh, so it'll be a matter of figuring out how things work, who, who the champions are, because there are always people within um, a culture that you can work with and that want to try to understand why you would try to make things different and, and can help you to champion those things and, and get, things, uh, get things moving in the right direction. Um, 
kind of touching on the uh, the needs for some Canadian couples down in Bolivia if, if there was somebody here today and they kind of felt that tug or they they, they have this constant uh, feeling that global is something that they need to be doing with their life but they're afraid to explore that option what would you for a couple who have gone through that um, what would you, if somebody was here what would you say to them how would you how would you describe the next step for them I say the most important thing is is to take the step of investigating. Take step out, put your big toe in the water, because the reality is, you know, you think that oh well, I'm a banker, I'm a doctor, I'm a pastor, I'm a theologian, like all those things. That this is maybe God is calling me in these in this area. And first of all, it, and you know, this is just our limited experience. But typically, you know, it's not that often that God calls you to go to Timbuktu to to uh, do medical missions, like specific, specific, specific. God calls you he calls us to give what we have where he's working and you know what it may be Bolivia it may be somewhere else it might be in your backyard but I think it's important to take that step because you know I once read uh, uh, a book written to doctors by a by a medical fellow and he said he said he couldn't he couldn't uh, number all the interns who Christian interns studying to be doctors who were saying you know oh yeah when I finish my training I want to be I want to be involved in medical missions you know I want to do that and uh, but his his comment was that you know God doesn't can't really call those people that are sitting in the parking lot so most of those folks never got out of the parking lot like I want to do that but so I think it's that get out of the parking lot and you know it, it can open up a whole new uh, door and as our son said you know mom not everybody has to sell everything and move to Africa you know but <laughs> but but he just might <laughs> I've, I've had this conversation with a number of couples often you know mid-career kind of uh, life stages and uh, um, there's always excuses you know and the, and if you if you wait for all the stars to line up your, your next big decision will be which retirement home am I going to go to? Because the, ki the kids are at some stage, the parents are sick or getting old, the, you know, the business needs a few more years to get things lined up. And I, and I say, you know what, we, we need to be good stewards, but you need to be ready to say, you know what, I think about the disciples, <laughs> you know, they chucked the fishing gear in five minutes. Like it wasn't, you know, I got to get this lined up, I got to get this passed on to, to my son because he's going to take over the business and it just like go. So anyway, the <laughs> thank you. That was an excellent answer. Um, at this time, I'd like to ask uh, Kelly Terrace and Stan Barrio to, to come on up. I'll ask you guys to stand. Uh, right now, we're just going to have a congregational prayer for, for you guys. Um, I'd actually ask everybody to, to, to stand with us and we'll have Kelly lead us in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, dear God, we've just been so blessed to have the Susies here with us this morning to learn and help us learn as a church as to where they've been for the last seven years in Rwanda and where they're going forward in Latin America. Dear God, we think of the work that's gone on in Rwanda and we continue to pray for the nationals there and the CBM partners who are continuing to work um, and to continuing to work with the people in the local churches there. We continue to pray for them. Dear God, we pray for the Susis as they make this transition into Latin America and uh, specifically uh, going to Bolivia. They've articulated well um, some of their needs and their concerns uh, with uh, learning culturally um, things there, uh, continued language learning, and uh, also uh, physical things like finding a home and a car and things like that. Dear God, we just pray for the work that they're doing there. We pray for their partners that are there, and we pray for um, the developmental work that's going to go on there. We pray that you just be an encouragement and, and uh, their strength and their wisdom at this time. We also think of the Susies and their family back here in Canada. We think of their three children and their families and how it must be difficult to be away from their parents for long term, uh, at, at, for times at long, uh, long time. 
um, dear God, we sure, um, I'm sure that the Susies miss their grandchildren and their children. We just pray that um, they continue to have good communication with them. We think of the Susie's aging parents and uh, the worry and concern that Bruno and Kathleen have for them being far away, dear God. And we just pray that you would give Bruno and Kathleen a sense of peace with that, dear God. And dear God, as, our, as they're sending church, dear God, we need to continue to support them, both prayerfully and financially, dear God. And as they begin this new chapter in Bolivia, we just ask you to please uh, pray for them, encourage and strengthen them, dear God. In your name, amen. amen.